National Marijuana News. You have found the country's first unbiased news program about medical and recreational marijuana. Science, medicine, legal, business, lifestyle, entertainment. Coming up, attorney Norman Goldman is in our studio today talking about the Controlled Substances Act and how it may soon be changing when it comes to marijuana. Hollywood actor, writer, and director John Stockwell joins us to talk about his new film, Kid Cannabis. All this and more on today's edition of the National Marijuana News. With your host, Bruce Kelly. Welcome to the National Marijuana News, America's only unbiased source for breaking news on medical and recreational marijuana. On today's show, we welcome lawyer and radio show host, Norm Goldman. And the latest movie about marijuana comes from director John Stockwell. He co-wrote and directed Kid Cannabis. But first, here's the headlines with Jen Gentile. A drug dealing iPhone game where users grow and sell cannabis was pulled recently by Apple after it shot to number one on its app store. Weed Firm lets users control a character named Ted Growing, who inherits a commercial marijuana operation and wants to expand his empire. The game has dozens of different strains of cannabis and lets players tackle different challenges like dangerous gangsters and crooked cops. But users were upset when the game disappeared from the app store. Its creators, Manitoba Games, claimed it was entirely Apple's decision. The game was also available on Google Android, but was also removed. The company promised its users that they will be back soon, possibly with a new and improved censored version. Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper recently signed a bill that will fund up to $10 million for research into the medical benefits of marijuana. Bill SB 155 will take the money collected from medical marijuana fees and put it into a meaningful effort to study the therapeutic and medical benefits of the drug. The research will help Colorado determine which medical conditions should be added to the state's current list of eight ailments that make patients eligible for medical marijuana. It will also help physicians better understand the biochemical effects of prescribed marijuana and possibly allow the state to conduct clinical trials. Colorado legalized marijuana for medical use in 2000. There are currently more than 115,000 patients on the state's registry. Local water districts in Colorado and Washington state contract with federal water projects and officials from some of those districts think the federal government will turn off the water. In Washington state, the Rosa Irrigation District supplies federal water to about 72,000 acres. It issued a precautionary message to water customers who may be involved in state legal marijuana grow operations. The impact could be worse in Washington than in Colorado, since the Bureau of Reclamation controls the water supply for about two-thirds of Washington's irrigated land. The Bureau of Reclamation is likely to announce a decision soon. The largest study of its kind has found that smoking marijuana, even regularly and heavily, does not lead to lung cancer. The results were so surprising, the lead scientist in the study admitted the findings were against his expectations. Pulmonologist Donald Tashkin works at the University of California at Los Angeles and has studied marijuana for 30 years. His study was funded by the National Institutes of Health's National Institute on Drug Abuse and involved almost 3,000 patients with and without lung, neck, and head cancer. He and his group hypothesized that there would be a positive association between marijuana use and lung cancer and that the association would be more positive with heavier use. Instead, what they found was that there was no association at all, and there was even a hint of a type of protective effect from the plant. Federal health and drug enforcement officials have used Tashkin's past work on marijuana to make a case that the drug is dangerous. And even with the new study, Tashkin still believes marijuana is potentially harmful, but that its cancer-causing effects are less of a concern than previously thought. While no association between marijuana smoking and cancer was found, the study did find a 20-fold increase in lung cancer among people who smoke two or more packs of cigarettes a day. Coming up, the Controlled Substances Act and how it may soon be changing when it comes to marijuana. Here's Bruce Kelly with the National Marijuana News. Most of America isn't aware of what scheduling is when it comes to drugs. Almost 45 years ago, President Richard Nixon signed into law the Controlled Substances Act. 
Marijuana was classified as a Schedule I drug along MDMA, heroin, and LSD. And many say that the simple descheduling of marijuana to a Schedule II or III drug would change the entire scope of the medical marijuana movement, and probably for the better, they say. Norman Goldman is a well-known attorney, legal analyst, and talk show host. He's the host of the Norman Goldman Show, and you can check for local times in your area at normangoldman.com. Boy, is this dangerous. Two radio guys and a lawyer at the same time getting together. <laughs> Very nice to meet you. Norm, welcome to the National Marijuana News. Thanks for inviting Let's me. Let's get right to it. Marijuana's federally legal, but yet it's recreationally legal in two states. Pardon me if I seem to be confused about this, but how is it possible? It's a really great question, and the answer is, it goes back to the very founding of this nation. We are a federalist society where the United States government gets limited powers, specified limited powers in the Constitution. The states get unlimited powers. The states can order people to buy car insurance, which they do. The states, led by Massachusetts, can order people to buy health insurance. States have unlimited powers. They gave up some of those powers to the federal government at the beginning. The power to, in, uh, to do international treaties, for example. The power to do international diplomacy, national defense. So the federal government is its own sovereign, but so are the states. The states cannot be ordered around by the federal government. The federal government cannot order the states to enact a law. The federal government cannot order the states to unenact a law. The states have a tremendous amount of leeway and elbow room to enact their own public policies in their own states. So you're saying there's wiggle room out of the federal law? Tons of it. And as long as certain backs are turned, then... <laughs> we call that prosecutorial discretion. Okay. Watch the big words. <laughs> that's, that's what we call is prosecutorial discretion. And, and what you see is in Colorado, which is a perfect test tube example, Bruce, because what you've got is the federal government saying, we think it's illegal, and Colorado saying, we think it's legal. So the Colorado law enforcement authorities will not do anything about it. No local police will make arrests. No local prosecutors will charge crimes. No local jailers will put people in prison. If the federal government wants to enforce its laws inside Colorado, they have their own federal law enforcement officials, the FBI, the DEA. They have their own prisons. They have their own courts. There's nothing stopping the federal government today, yesterday, and tomorrow from going into Colorado and arresting people for marijuana, taking them into federal court, charging them with federal crimes by federal prosecutors and putting them in federal prisons after trying them in front of federal juries. These are two different layers of government, two very different systems, and they have to operate sort of independently. But wouldn't the users also be responsible if the federal government did that and the local law officials would be breaking the federal law too by not enforcing it? Well, law enforcement locally is not bound to enforce federal law. Federal law is enforced by federal law gotcha. enforcement. Sometimes you'll find cooperation, and that is very much encouraged in our system. So you'll see on immigration, for example, local enforcement working with federal enforcement to find illegal immigrants and deport them. But that's all voluntary. When we're talking about the straight law, the federal government has every right to enforce federal law in federal courts with federal personnel, gotcha. but the states are not bound by any of that, and that's why we see Colorado and Washington and all of these other states going their own way. The federal government, for its part right now, because of who's in charge of it, has chosen as a matter of prosecutorial discretion to back off. If there were a Republican administration, they would be enforcing the laws in federal courts with federal prosecutors in Colorado and Washington State. Prosecutorial discretion. Discretion, okay. Give you a fast example. What if a homeless person steals an apple because he's starving? The prosecutor decides not to charge him with a crime, even though it's technically a theft. Sure. So that's prosecutorial discretion. You, you apply the prosecutor prosecutor's discretion to say, I'm not going to charge a crime here, even though technically one was committed. What's appropriate. Exactly. That's why prosecutors are, have discretion, and that's why we have to be careful who the prosecutors are. Let's get into scheduling. <clears throat> Excuse me. Why is it an important topic in the medical marijuana industry? Well, it would be nice to have research 
I mean, we're missing, we've missed many decades of research. The guys in the white lab coats, you know, with the pocket protectors, just with their beaker tubes, and they're just their regular scientific method. If we'd had a lot of science applied to finding the medical properties of marijuana, we could discover whether it was as awful as the opponents say it is, or if it's as good as the proponents say it is. But we've missed all that time. The scheduling that we have now is kind of arbitrary. Congress just said marijuana is awful, let's make it the worst possible thing. But then Congress delegated the authority to actually manage the schedule to two agencies, the Drug Enforcement Administration and the Food and Drug Administration. So you can move drugs around in the schedule administratively through the two government agencies and they can do it, uh, it really won't change a lot that's happening in the states now. That's all for the federal government's purposes. Don't you find it weird though that heroin and cocaine are a two and marijuana is a one? It's really weird, but you know, cocaine, just as an aside, has medicinal value. And that originally <coughs> was in the uh, early uh, 1900s. And not only that, but even today, people with end-stage colon cancer get, and I know it's kind of sad, but they get cocaine enemas, which really relieves their pain. And so, you know, for people, and my mother died of colon cancer, I mean, it does provide relief. So there is medical benefit even from cocaine. And I would imagine if we did enough research on heroin and MDMA and all of these other drugs with particular diseases, we might find all kinds of medical benefits for people with Lou Gehrig's disease, people with muscular dystrophy. You just never know until you do the research. As long as the research is done. We're talking exactly. with uh, Norm Goldman. Go to normangoldman.com if you want to find out showtimes in your area for his uh, radio show. He's also a heck of a lawyer. Uh, do you think medical marijuana legalization is possible throughout the country without a change as to how it's scheduled? It's going to be very difficult because this kind of dissonance that we have between the states and the federal government creates a tension that's going to be very hard to keep going for a long time. I think ultimately it's a matter of policy and politics more than it is law because at some point Congress is going to wake up and say we're missing billions of dollars in revenue here revenue. just like with cigarettes just like with tobacco uh, and alcohol. alcohol I mean we're bringing in they call them sin taxes right because tobacco and alcohol are sins but we bring in billions of dollars and we've been able to discourage smoking we've never banned smoking but we've been able to reduce the incidence of smoking by heavily taxing it so Congress at some point is going to wake up and say this is ridiculous the drug cartels have been making billions of dollars off of this stuff. We've had tremendous violence and death. We've had people incarcerated. We've got to bring this into the normal uh, range of life, just like we did with alcohol after prohibition. Well, the cartels have already shifted their focus onto other things. Well, I, the easier way, the more legally legitimate way to deal with medical marijuana on the federal government level would be to reschedule it through the administrative process. Politically, it gets the president away from the process. Yes. The president, if he did an executive order, it, you he might as well it. just plaster it on yeah. his forehead yeah. he owns it. and it's his. But if he just let the rulemaking, you know, bureaucrats handle it in the administrative agency, it would take months, the public would be able to debate it, the public would be able to form a new opinion, and then the rulemaking, then the president could say, look, I had nothing to do with it. It's all done in the administrative agency. They make rules all the time. If you'd like to listen to the entire interview with Norman Goldman, find it on our website, thenationalmarijuananews.com. Next, Hollywood actor, writer, and director John Stockwell joins us to talk about his new film, so stick around. This is the National Marijuana News. With the medical marijuana movement growing, we can expect that Hollywood will eventually begin to release films about what's really happening across the country. <clears throat> Films about the stoner culture have been a part of movie making for years. But with all of the serious undertones that medical marijuana is creating, there could be a shift from pulling off one-liners to pulling at the heartstrings. And the latest movie about marijuana comes from director John Stockwell. He co-wrote and directed Kid Cannabis, which tells the true story of a 2002 murder of an Idaho man and the drug smuggling rivalry that led to the crime. Welcome to the National Marijuana News, John. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. I just gave a quick synopsis of the, uh, of the plot. Give me a little bit more, if you don't mind. Well, I had read an article in Rolling Stone magazine by Mark 
Brunelli called Kid Cannabis about Nate Norman, who was uh, at the time a 19-year-old uh, pizza delivery kid who went from making you know, six dollars an hour delivering pizzas to 60 million a year smuggling BC Bud across the border into Idaho, and uh, he was kind of a nerdy, uh, you know, sort of loser kid who who managed to turn himself into this un very unlikely drug kingpin, and I'd, I'd wanted to do. A, a, uh, a Scarface movie, but one set in the in the in the rural white world, and that didn't involve meth and um, chainsaws. <laughs> <laughs> didn't involve meth. Didn't involve heroin. Uh, you know, there was something about doing this story, especially since it involved weed, that I thought we could have fun with it. Obviously, there's a murder. His rival uh, in in the business was uh, this kid Brendan Butler, who was the adopted son of the wealthiest uh, one of the wealthiest families in Coeur d'Alene. Um, and he, Brendan Butler hired hitmen to kill Nate Norman. The hitmen turned the hit on Brendan, killed him. This turned into finally the Fed started paying attention, and now the murderer of Brendan Butler spent less time in jail than Nate Norman spent for smuggling weed. So basically, the. the not that the script wrote itself, but that story was was you know really handy. That's one of those stories that, that if, if I had to go in and pitch it to to uh, the studios or any financier, they would just say, "Come on, please, that it's can't happen. Real. That that's so silly." Uh, you you said about this article in in Rolling Stone. Um, what was the number one item out of that article that that really clicked? I mean, the heart of it. Just that this schlubby white kid who loved his family, loved his mother, loved his brother, um, uh, was able to do this operation so simply. Literally, they, they just ran across the border, the eight miles, and they were dealing at the time with a hippie grower, um, got his friends with backpacks, they ran back. You know, there was no guns involved. There were, there were no, uh, you know, cartel members. There was, you know, no choppers. It was very low tech, very simple. He got, in the end, they were making 15, you know, he was paying people up to 15K a run. So he had every, he had the quarterback from the football team, the cheerleaders, everyone in town wanting to get in on this. And the other thing that really struck me was how no one in Idaho, in Coeur d'Alene, Ever asked any questions about where the money was coming from? As long as the money was coming, you know, he was he was buying boats and houses and uh, cars with cash. And as long as you know, Idaho is kind of a live and let live. If if the only thing they probably fear more or like less than drug dealers is the federal government. So they are very much we don't care what you do. Just close the the gate on the pasture when you come sure. through. Don't let our livestock loose. Um, and he did, you know, he did very well there. Well, for this a long was time. similar to what was going on in South Florida in the late '70s, with uh, uh, all the money that was being spent on real estate and boats, yes. and uh, people turned a blind eye about the cash because, guess what? When you've got that much cash in front of you, it's okay. Yeah, yeah I don't, yeah. I don't need to know where it came from. <laughs> but no one in <laughs> our story spoke <laughs> Spanish. No one graduated from high school. Um, uh, I, I just like the the, uh, the the sort of Horatio Alger component of it, um, and all and, and all Nate, you know, again, violence came into the picture because of a rival drug dealer, but it wasn't because he was a gangbanger. It was he was actually um, the son of a multimillionaire who just for his hubris didn't like the fact that this kid was coming in and and basically having better parties than he was having. Uh, he, he didn't care as much about the fact that he was uh, making more money or taking any of his business. He cared the fact that he was getting the girls to go to his parties instead of instead of Brendan Butler's. Yes, we're talking with uh, John Stockwell. He is the director of the brand new movie Kid Cannabis, which I caught on on demand a couple of weeks ago. Uh, McGinley, uh, John McGinley just yeah, killed great. his role. I mean, you've seen him in everything from uh, Scrubs to Platoon. Uh, Platoon. To, to, uh, he's a great, great actor. And he lives next to me in, in, um, in Malibu. And I had asked him to come up there, and he said, "John, I don't. I, I used to smoke weed. I don't smoke weed anymore. Um, as long as I don't have to smoke weed, we promised him we wouldn't have to." We were doing a scene with a vaporizer, and at the time, our prop guy had brought up some fake weed, and it looked terrible in the close-ups. Some of the actors wanted to smoke real weed. John McGinley wanted to smoke our herb weed, and there was a mix-up in the vaporizer. And after one take, he's like, that was real weed. And I was like, no, I don't think so. And he was so mad. He was like, you got me stoned. I haven't smoked weed. And, you You're know. supposed to give me the stunt weed. Uh, uh, the sc yeah, the stunt <laughs> weed. But fake weed, I mean, it looks terrible. And, and in fact, I think it may be more harmful because every time 
we would have actors smoke it, they would end up having, you know, coughing jags and wake up the next morning with a sore throat. So a lot of them chose to smoke real bud. The, the only question was pacing because, you know, you could do a couple takes and it'd be good and then they'd just start getting <laughs> sometimes silly sure. and lose track of the plot. And, you know, that was something we had to be concerned How about. How do you think this story would have ended if marijuana uh, had been legal 12 years ago? Well, there wouldn't have been this story probably if marijuana had been legal because the you know I think the people that some of the people most opposed are the 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 traffickers and the the the, the some of the growers who because of the value um, there there is no real value now in in sneaking BC bud across the border um, or smuggling BC bud across the border. So um, you know when people say legalization takes the crime out of it, 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 it absolutely does. And um, I think that, that, that this marketplace is, is just no longer there. If you'd like to hear more of this interview with John Stockwell, just go to our website. You're watching the National Marijuana News. This is the National Marijuana News with your host, Bruce Kelly. And that's it for this edition of the National Marijuana News. Thanks for joining us. And to join in on the conversation, go to our website at thenationalmarijuananews.com or Facebook, facebook.com forward slash nationalmjnews. If you really want to be heard, leave us your thoughts on our toll-free hotline. Sound off. Tell us what you think about anything you've seen or heard here on the National Marijuana News. Until next time, I'm Bruce Kelly here on the National Marijuana News. You have found the country's first unbiased news program about medical and recreational marijuana. Science, medicine, legal, business, lifestyle, entertainment. You've been watching the National Marijuana News.